Thank you very much. It is a true pleasure to be here, especially representing the United States. Uh, what's very interesting is that what I've been hearing so far from this conference resonates tremendously with a movement that is going on in the United States and one which my university and my center have basically been promulgating. Uh, my name again is Don Marinelli. I'm a professor of drama and arts management who for the last 15 years has been living in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. If you're not familiar with Carnegie Mellon University, it is renowned as an engineering school, as a computer science school, for artificial intelligence, for robotics, and for the arts. And that's where we get the Entertainment Technology Center. The Entertainment Technology Center is, in fact, a coming together of computer science and the arts. It occurred back in 1998. I was a drama professor who, a few years earlier, had crossed over to computer science. Why? Because in the course of traveling the country, you need to know that our drama department is the oldest school of drama in America. We are among the most famous. My job in drama was to go to Hollywood for parties. <laughs> when I wasn't doing that, I was going to New York for the opening of Broadway shows. So we, in fact, we used to talk about the Carnegie Mellon Mafia in Hollywood, the Carnegie Mellon Mafia in New York. But about the mid-90s, something very strange was starting to happen. As I was touring the country, auditioning young people for the School of Drama, I discovered to my dismay that fewer and fewer of them were interested in my art form. Fewer were interested in the art form for which they were applying. And I had this epiphany. One day with a group like you, of young people auditioning, I said, okay, let's have a reality check here. How many of you, if it's Friday night, on your own volition, will pay money to go see live theater? And a few hands went up. A few. I said, how many of you would gladly go to the cinema? More hands went up. Then I said, how many of you would much rather order a couple of supreme pizzas from Domino's and sit at home and play video games with a case of beer and practically every hand went up. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, there's been a revolution and no one told me about it. There has been a complete paradigm shift. And I had the choice of either becoming an old fart professor sitting there lamenting that young people just don't get it anymore. <laughs> they don't appreciate the arts the way we do. Or I could try to find out what is it about interactive digital media that they found so interesting. So I was brought together with a computer scientist who would go on to become arguably the most famous computer scientist of all times. His name was Randy Pausch. Have you ever heard of the last lecture, the professor who was dying of pancreatic cancer and whose last lecture appeared on YouTube? Well, in America, it was the biggest thing. Over 10 million downloads. My partner, Randy, went out with a bang. And so the two of us were brought together and told to figure out how to capture the dynamism of this revolution. And we came up with the Entertainment of the Technology Center, which had three purposes. A brand new degree. We call it the Masters of Entertainment Technology. Secondly, we want industry to be our friend. And by industry, I mean both for-profit industry and not-for-profit industry. Not-for-profit industry are museums, hospitals, schools, science centers. For-profit is everything you can imagine from the New York Stock Exchange. 
The other thing we wanted to promote was entrepreneurialism. America is all about the self-made person. We wanted to do everything possible so that students with ideas would have the knowledge and the means to create new companies. Because we, I live in a city called Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is known as the Steel City. There's only one problem with that. There's no more steel. Steel is gone. In my lifetime, steel has become an anachronism. When I moved to Pittsburgh, the nights glowed with the fire of melting steel, of ingots. And in my lifetime, it is completely gone. So our university, similar to what you have here, has been charged with helping to create the future. And our future in Pittsburgh, we figured out, was going to be in education, was going to be in technology, and was going to be in healthcare. So the ETC was founded with the idea of non-technologists and technologists coming together in partnership. And it also recognized that for young people today, they live in an inter-reality. It is an inter-reality because there is the real world that we are sitting in, but there is the virtual world which is equally as real, except it does not have form. It does not have corporeal form to it. It is the bringing together of the temporal and the spatial worlds. It is also recognizing what we call the triumph of the gamer. It occurred almost a decade ago in the United States that gaming is a bigger industry than Hollywood. Video games now surpass movies and television combined. And guess what? It's never going back. And the reasons for this are many, and we're going to get into them, but for the most part, it's because of the empowerment that is manifest in interactive digital media, where you are, in fact, a participant rather than merely a viewer. Let's go on. This talk normally takes about an hour and a half, so we're on speed now. We're speeding. The curriculum that we have, what we call the curriculum for the 21st century digital native, is nicknamed SAIT. There are four components. Storytelling, architecture, technology, and experience. You could say this is the new reading, writing, and arithmetic. Let's go into it in great depth. Listening to you talk about story made my heart beat faster. Having a conference where the first word is tales of, from the north, it's like, yes, we're resonating. You see, storytelling is increasingly a major educational and identifying factor. Think about Facebook. Think about YouTube. Think about all the media that is basically empowering you to tell me what you think, tell me what you feel, tell me what you believe. What we've had to do is provide a structure for that. So, for example, all of our students must learn the new poetics. If, you've, if you have any sort of liberal arts background, you're familiar with the old poetics of Aristotle. Plot, character, theme, diction, rhythm, music, spectacle. These are combined with the poetics of interactivity, which were identified by Janet Murray in her seminal work, Hamlet on the Holiday. Interactivity is comprised of immersion, agency, transformation, and navigation. For all of our students, these become not just words, these become living, breathing things. Because what are we able to do with technology? We are able to create a world that is more real than reality. And virtual reality, which has become a reality for most young people, can be defined as an event or entity that is real in effect, but not in fact. But there should not be anything radical in that notion. Because have you ever dreamt I remember t uh, telling people I was asked to write a, an article for a German magazine. And I wrote in there that virtual reality is one of the oldest experiences of humankind. 
And my German editors came back going, we don't think you understand what we're asking of you. How can you say that it's one of the oldest things when there wasn't electricity? And I said, it's very simple. It's called dreaming. I don't know about you, but I now remember my dreams better than I know what I did yesterday. Those dreams are virtual realities. They can either be chemically induced, maybe they're spiritually induced, but they were in fact real events to me. So the new poetics leads us to an emphasis on storytelling. But storytelling in and of itself is not enough. We must explain and we must delve into what is the meaning of story. For example, storytelling is a craft. As a drama professor, I would know what I was dealing with with a group of students by giving them a simple spelling test. I would ask them to spell one word, playwright. And if they sat there going, oh, that's easy, P-L-A-Y-R-I-G-H-T, fail. They forgot a letter there. It was the letter W, which means they had no concept of the word right, W-R-I-G-H-T, because right is a craftsperson. In English, we have the word shipwright, one who crafts ships. We have the word wheelwright, one who crafts wheels. A playwright is one who crafts plays. And as, as coming from a culture of craftsmanship, you know how to be a craftsperson you must understand your resource. You must understand the physics, the science of the wood, of the, of the tusk, and yet have the artistry to turn it into something else, into something iconic, something filled with image. So all of our students must learn the craft of story. We also teach them the primary plot structure of the Western world, what we call the climactic plot structure your classic inciting incident, progressive complication, crisis, climax, denouement. And we teach that to them the same way if you're learning guitar, you learn your scales. Because if you learn that, then you will be able to play anything and you can really diverge from that and explore new areas. All of our students take improvisational acting, even the geeks. There's nothing funnier than when you have a bunch of computer scientists who look at their schedule and see acting. They come up and they go, I, I think there's a mistake here. Of, of you, you I'm a geek and you have me taking an acting class. And we go, there's no mistake. <laughs> and you know what? Most of the geeks are better in improvisational acting than the artists because they've suddenly been liberated. They've suddenly been, become free. We also have a class called visual story because the one thing about this new medium is it's a storytelling image. It's a storytelling medium. And so basically they take a film class as part of their studies. And like any kid today, they get to make a movie video, they get to make a documentary, they get to make trailers, but they have to learn shot composition, Final Cut Pro, you can make, anybody can make a movie on their computer. We do it as a structured class. But the focus is always, how does technology facilitate story? There's more to story, though. If we leave it at story, we do story a disservice. Because why do we tell stories? What is the purpose of story? Stories are cause and effect understanding put into practice. Why are we watching soap operas constantly? Because we're all young or old psychologists trying to figure out why people do what they do. Because in observing that, we're trying to figure out why do I do what I do? And by figuring out what I, why I do what I do, maybe I will finally figure out who am I? The ultimate ontological question. Stories are trial and error exercises. As you know, in, in your culture better than, than the West, 
It's how we convey values, culture, myths, and the very process of socialization. Most of my students are astounded when I tell them, you have become who you are primarily through comedy. They're like, what? I go, primarily through comedy. Because if you take a look at tragedy and comedy, which come from the very same tree, comedy is what socializes us. If, we, if, if when our daughter was getting dressed, if, if we looked at something and said, oh my God, you don't want to go out in that, you knew she would go out in it. But if her friends saw it and laughed at it, she would never wear it again. Think about what we laugh at. We laugh at characters who think they're going to get ahead by cheating society. We laugh at characters who think there's always a get rich quick. We're laughing at them because we know what the values are of our society, and we know that's not how you're supposed to do it. It is comedy that teaches us socialization. Stories are problem-solving techniques. That's one of the reasons why do not diss video games. Video games allow you to do it over. Guess what? In life, you seldom are able to do it over. Don't you? How many times if I, have you had an experience in your life where you wish you could set, push the reset button? <laughs> All right? I got about a billion of them. Okay? But in a video game, that's what you can do. It is all about probabilistic reasoning. It's about teleological reasoning. Teleological reasoning is consequential thought. The greatest game of consequential thought is chess. Chess is a game with very little agency. Agency meaning activity. But every action you make is significant. Every action you make will have impact on the remainder of the game. So when we talk about teleological reasoning, it, it's at work in chess and it's at work in the pub. When you see the young lady you want to approach and you think, okay, let me try this line. <laughs> Hello, babe, come here often. And then she throws something in your face and walks away and you realize, well, that didn't make it. Next time I'll try something else. <laughs> Stories are compressions of life. It's funny, sometimes I'll have students going, what do you mean? You know, like, how can you tell a story in like a couple of minutes? And I go, have you ever heard of a song? What do you think songs are? In America, we have a very famous song called A Boy Named Sue by Johnny Cash. It's two minutes and 22 seconds. You listen to that song one time, you know the story of the boy named Sue. It's all around us. And lastly, if stories are how we discern meaning, and wisdom. All right, let's continue. Learn by doing was how Carnegie Mellon University was founded in the year 1900 by Andrew Carnegie. We in our program take that a step further. Not only must you, must you do something, you must do it for someone else. In other words, you should see the impact of your work. And if the impact of your work is able to make the world better, we've just succeeded. We do projects. My program is four semesters. There are classes only in the first semester. The next three semesters, you will build something as part of a team for a client. Let me give you an example. Carnegie Library came to us with a, with a serious problem. Don, we're seeing fewer and fewer children come to the library. What are we going to do about it? Don, as an old man, said, I don't know. Why don't we ask the students? The students came up with my story maker. My story maker is a kiosk-based device which has got the classic page from a story book, a children's book. But on that, you can drag and drop characters, objects, scenery. And when they appear on that page, they come to life and underneath it, the words will appear, once upon a time, there was a dinosaur. Drag a little boy and a little boy who had a ball and a bat. And this goes on and on. And when the story is done, they push the big green button, and guess what? It prints the book. 
And then they take the book and they bring it to grandma and grandpa and they go, Grandma, I, bought, I wrote a story for you. And grandpa reads the story and says, Donnie, that was wonderful. I can't wait to read the next one. And then little Donnie goes to mom, hey, mom, when are we going back to the library? Because you see, if they do that enough time, then they realize there's all these other stories that they want to start reading. We got this panicked phone call from the library about six months ago. You know that thing you built for us? Yes. We put it online. Oh, okay. We are now swamped with stories from all over the world. We need a new server. Can you give us more storage? 10 minutes? Okay. What you're talking about in terms of capturing stories, we have a technology called synthetic interviews, which very simply is bringing people back from the dead. You're now able to have a conversation with Benjamin Franklin, with Albert Einstein, with Charles Darwin, with Lincoln, with Westinghouse, even with me through this technology we created. We use storytelling to bring historical uh, artifacts to life. We have a World War II submarine in Pittsburgh, which the, the submariners are gone. People were not getting any information. We took, I said, give me the submarine. We installed a dozen touch screens People now spend as long as they want learning the history of the sub. Let's talk about architecture. Architecture is phenomenal because it now exists both virtually and corporeally. Within the realm of digital media, architecture has a mathematical basis because the architecture you see in a video game is made up of polygons. When you think about it, polygons are molecules. They become the building blocks of virtual sp space able to take any form whatsoever. There's another analogy to architecture in that it's anatomical. We talk about skeletal wireframes. And upon those skeletal wireframes, we lay a musculature. And on that musculature, we put texture, color, light, reflective qualities to bring out the reality of the, uh, what we're creating. And if you want to get even more in depth, Let's talk about quantum mechanics, because the walls on a video game are simply collision detection algorithms. In other words, mass that you see in a video game is essentially an illusion, which is exactly what quantum physicists have been telling us. This is a video game we built for the New York City Fire Department. It teaches firefighters about hazardous material handling. It is built the exact same way we would build a video game to save the Earth from an alien invasion. Children today grow up knowing about virtual worlds. This is Disney's Toontown Online. It had been the biggest children's massively multiplayer online role-playing game until the advent of Pixie Hollow, which is all about fairies. Pixie Hollow was built in Pittsburgh by my alums. You take a look at Spore by Will Wright. This is a complete ecosystem. And when you talk about architecture, there's the structure behind the architecture. This, for example, is a show control flow diagram that basically is the anatomy of how a system works. Then there's real architecture. It's time for schools to stop looking like morgues. It's time for schools to stop looking like hospitals. So our school is really cool. This is the entrance to the Entertainment Technology Center. We decided that our metaphor is going to be a starship. So when you get off the elevator, Robbie the robot greets you, and you are on board Starship ETC. Throughout the hall, we have Iron Man. We've got Batman, Robin. We've got all the Batman movies playing simultaneously. And in fact, the newest Batman movie was just wrapped in Pittsburgh. I sat in the Batmobile. <laughs> Let's talk about technology. Because technology is the easiest thing. Technology is like grass growing to young people. But the, we make a mistake if we do not recognize the emo that emotion drives technology. If I were to ask you to use your computer because I had an experiment, if you were smart, you would say, Don, you seem like a nice guy, but I don't know where you've been. You might have viruses. But if I come to you and say, 
You want to help me find the little green men from Mars? Me computer as Sue computer. Over three million people said, you can use my computer. I had the misfortune slash fortune in 2001 of being diagnosed with a very rare cancer. I'm still here, but immediately thereafter, I signed up for a distributed computing project through Oxford University that used the cycles of my computer to test chemical compounds against cancer proteins. That was a way in which I could help science defeat what I was suffering through. When we talk about technology, what do we mean now? I mean today. Augmented reality has, be, has exploded. We're doing tremendous work in augmenting reality, meaning here's reality, what can I layer on top of it? Alternate reality, very big. We do a great deal of work on 4D immersive experiences. And the other thing is we love to aggregate input devices and display devices. When we started the ETC, we figured we would be doing video games. Since then, to our astonishment, we now have, we do more work in edutainment than entertainment. We are doing tremendous amounts of work in medical diagnosis and medical therapy, as well as information creation management and advanced social networking. We love games. All young people uh, love games. So use the games to your advantage. We started something called experimental gameplay. This has grown into global game jam. It occurs every January. There's oh, this past January, something like 134 countries, thousands upon thousands of young people making a game in 48 hours and then having the world test it and say, that was cool, I didn't get that. We like to build things. This is a device called a jamma drum. All of our students must learn to build a game for this in two weeks. You'll notice it's four players. We have two rules, no pornography and no shooting violence. Not because we're prudes, but because those have both been done very well. We love problems. Children's Museum of Pittsburgh comes to us. We've got a big problem, Don. We've got one of the world's best collection of puppets. Well, what's the problem? The kids are not allowed to touch them. I said, oh, you're right. You have one of the world's best collection of ugly dolls. What do we do about that? The students came up. They did 360 animations of every single puppet, created this input device, created a new technology called animateering. In 15 weeks, installed all of this in the museum. It was so successful, the museum built a new wing to house the animateering dynamic. And then the other thing we teach our kids is give back. Give Kids the World is in Kissimmee, Florida. That's Orlando. It's the world's leading make-a-wish destination. We've adopted them. Every year we will do projects for them. It is the most happy, positive place on the planet Earth, but it is populated by children who are dying. It was the dream of a concentration camp survivor who said, if I can survive this horror, where I'm a young person who wants to live surrounded by death, then my gift is going to be a place of vitality and love and living for children who are dying. Hundreds of families are there every week. And it's a place that I want my students to be affiliated with. And we have created many technologies for them. This is called the Star Ferry. If I had more time, I'd, I'd go through it with you. Robots. Everyone loves robots. This is our official mascot. This robot was built in 15 weeks. You know, one of the joys of being a professor at my age is acknowledging that the students are smarter than I am. When the students came to me and said, we want to build our own robot, Randy and I looked at them and just started chuckling. 15 weeks later, this robot, 50 servo motors, Lord knows how much airplane cabling, and a back-end system that was brilliant was created. These are the newest robots, also known as androids. This is one that we've uh, taken from Japan. It's uh, by Kokoro Robotics. The other thing you have to recognize is that no matter how much you deal with technology, you do not know it all. What we need to do is to watch, look, and listen, and people will show us 
how technology can be used for their, in their life. And lastly, remember, we're an urban culture. So it's very important for me to bring these students back to the world. This is the world that they're used to. One of the things we do is all of our classes have public performances. These are students wearing head-mounted displays doing public performances. It's basically a 21st century form of vaudeville. And we actually need to take these young people outside. Outside is part of your world. It's not necessarily part of the world of American youth. So we make all of our students go and take whitewater rafting because there's no greater wake-up call than signing a death waiver form. They do ropes courses. They actually go out into the woods and hike. Those are real horses. They go on real horses. That's off-road driving where they can make like they're running over the faculty. And sometimes I like to do really crazy things like take our students at our different campuses because we have campuses all over the world. There's an ETC in San Francisco. There's an ETC in Seattle. There's an ETC in Osaka, Japan, Manchester, Barcelona, Madeira, uh, and relationships with Korea, Singapore. I tell my students who have four semesters, go, go to four continents, go see the world, and then sometimes you'll get a Zeppelin ride. These are all the different things that you will do in the program. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the way to educate digital natives in the 21st century. I can't believe I did this in a half hour. Okay.